class is on perennials. We're going to go over what perennials work well and then how to get them to bloom better. Pinching, deadheading, we'll go over foods, that kind of stuff. So we'll go into detail on how to get the most out of your, your perennial plants. Perennials are those things that come back every year. Okay, so they're, they're, they're permanent. P, perennial, permanent. They're more P for permanent. That's how I remember it. So annuals are, they're a flash of, of glory this year and then they just, they're dead. This winter it will die off. So there are no annuals in this list. Everything is perennial. What you get into really with your flowering things. And what I did is I brought a few, I brought a shrub, a grass, and some flowers that go together. You could plant them in the same garden and they would complement each other. So we'll go down that list. And then how to get them to bloom. What you'll find is we grow more perennials here than most other parts of the country. Because we're, we're a little bit warmer, we grow all those Midwest flowers and then some because we, we, we're just a warmer climate. And they'll bloom longer here. Uh, some of them will repeat bloom. They'll like bloom once and they come bloom again. Typically, the difference between a perennial and an annual is annuals flower and they don't stop until it freezes. That's pretty nice. That's a nice, I want it to be evergreen. I want it to bloom all the time. I want it to draw hummingbirds. That's what an annual really is. If it would only go through the winter and come back, it'd be a great. Perennials come back every year usually bigger than they were the, the following, the previous year. Um, but they only have a bloom cycle of about six weeks or so, maybe a little longer, some a little shorter, but basically about a month to a month and a half is the bloom cycle. So frequently you're trying to plant multiple different types of perennials together. So something is coming up in the spring and a summer thing is blooming and you get a fall thing blooming like your asters and moms. So you've always got something uh, cycling through. That's why wildflowers look so good. There's always something flushing at different times of the year. So you need to think through your perennials a little bit differently than you would your annuals, okay? I kind of blend mine together. I do a lot of containers. So I'll anchor my container with perennials. So I don't have to redo it every year, but I'll leave the front edge where I can change out some annuals. So I've got color year round. So I'll have pansies in the winter, violas, Dusty Miller, Kales, some of those are still blooming. They're still in my containers, so they just won't die. I'm almost getting tired of them. I want them to, I want them, I want to change out my annuals so I can play with colors. And then I've got my summer series that I'll change out. It's geraniums and marigolds and zinnias and these other summer loving things. June and July is a time to, to buy your perennials. It's tempting to buy them in the spring, but they aren't, they aren't in bloom in spring. They're just coming up to kind of green blobs in a bucket. Yes, they put real fancy tags to try to compensate for that, but you can't really tell what a plant is by the little picture tag that's faded some. You can't see the true color, you can't smell it, you can't touch it. Now you're seeing all the perennials in bloom. This, that's how you want to buy your perennials. Another quick insider tip, perennials, good perennials, will typically be a two-year-old to three-year-old plant. I've actually got some peonies that are five or six, seven years old. Uh, so they're at the farm much longer. An annual is typically six to nine weeks and they're in bloom. So you've got them in the greenhouse, you push them like crazy, they bloom. And so that's why you get a $1.99 annual because you don't hold on to them. We're not nurturing them for years, it's weeks, days. So a perennial, typically if it's in bloom, it's at least two years old. That's why they're typically a little more expensive. You'll notice that when you price them, there's a difference. That's because they're older, more mature. There's a cycle for it. If you get them on the internet, you'll typically get a plug. And so it's a, it's a one year old or a few days old plant. They'll ship it to you, but it won't bloom this year. If you keep it alive, it'll bloom next year. So that's why sometimes you're disappointed by internet kind of, kind of stuff. That's because it's a maturity level. Apples, tr fruit trees are the same way. It's gotta be a certain age before they uh, bloom or fruit. Okay. So, okay, where do we even start? So I see that we've got an email list going around, right? So I'm gonna, what I thought I would do is I would send you how to fertilize. When the rains start, it's, it's a cue that you need to fertilize. And so this is, this is the time. What I have is I've just gone through and fertilized and put the wheat preventers down in my own yard. Because if you do that now, you can actually flush growth on your trees and get more growth whole nother set of leaves on your on your aspens your ash locusts 
whole another set of flowers on your roses, whole another set of growth, because this is, a, this is actually another planting season. I find that it's even better in spring because the soil is warm. It's not as windy and dry. In the spring, it's cold at night. The, f the soil is bitter cold. You plant a plant in there and it just doesn't grow. It sits there and looks at it because it's shivering literally in the ground. And so then you, then you hit that new growth as it, as it awakens with some really dry spring air that's a prevailing wind that doesn't stop. That's hard on a plant. Now, yes, we get some ferocious storms, but it's not that prevailing wind that just tears up the leaves. The growth isn't as tender, it's more, more uh, mature. Uh, so you'll find that your success goes up and the air is humid. You feel that in the air right now. You, it's just more water in the air so the plants aren't drying out as fast. Much easier for you as a gardener to make a, you can't make a mistake. It's harder to make a mistake. Just because things aren't drying out, it's not as windy, it's just better. There's some shade cover called clouds. Plants <laughs> love clouds. In the spring, there's no cloud. There's no protection at all. You're just exposed. So this is a whole nother, you'll find your success goes up now. In fact, June is our hardest month to grow things. June is, everyone thinks it's January. Everything's frozen in time in January. You can't, you just plant it and just wait for it to wake up. June is the hot month. You saw how plants suffered. Even my own gardens, I couldn't water enough. They just looked beat up, hot. They were sweating bullets. They just, they were suffering. And so you just have to get plants to live through June, fertilize them when the rain comes. A whole new plant comes up. You just want to get them to live in June. And then get them over till the rains start. So really, as many months as you can plant before the month of June, the more roots you can get on the plant, the more success you'll have. And so July, August, September, this late monsoon through fall is your best, I think. I've had my best planting success this time of year through about October. Then it just gets cold. All the winter evergreens get planted in the winter. Okay, that's, that's when you kind of place them. Yeah, you can get too many evergreens. You Californians, I know that's offensive. Everyone loves, Californians love evergreens. Everything is evergreen. Sometimes you need some spring bloomers. Sometimes you need some summer bloomers, fall color, winter evergreen. Okay, should we go down the list of perennials? Things that come back. And what I did is I curated them yesterday and I put together some styles and some colors that would go together, companion plants. Mostly I have sunny things because we mainly have sun in our landscapes. I did put together one pretty nice shade garden. So some of you have some of these big junipers. You're in the pines, ponderosas, the north side of your house. Those are areas where you plant these shade things. And there's some really nice shade stuff. I should have brought a hydrangea up. No, that's okay. No, no, they can go without <laughs> hydrangea. They know what a hydrangea is. So what I did is I put together groups like this. We'll go over why, why they were good and uh, what, what pros and cons and that kind of stuff. And some of these are my favorites, or some I just put together color combos that work, work together, or they're just new and fancy, because I know I've got actual hardcore gardeners here. And gardeners, we get bored sometimes. You can only have so much red tip potinia before you bore your boredom. Uh, Russian sage, there's not one of those up here. Yes, it's the number one seller, but I'm not going to promote it because I'm tired of selling those. I pay my daughters more uh, uh, yeah, education with that one plant, but I think there's some other options that we can plant that are less invasive, less problematic. Okay, so one, um, let's go with this just because it's starting to bloom all around town. Why don't I take this chair? I'll just set it up right here. That way the camera can catch it a little bit better. This is, anyone know? Crape myrtle. Crape myrtle, yeah. Uh, this one actually is a different one. It's got red and, and white on the same plant. That's exciting. Usually you just get red or just white or just, this is a dynamite. Crape myrtle. Crape myrtles are a summer blooming plant. It waits till summer. It will keep blooming like this through fall. And then the fall color is just beautiful gold color. So it's very, very nice. So you get fall color. And you get this wonderful summer color. There's nothing as bright as a crepe myrtle. They'll get about this big. You folks from the south, you're used to your crepe myrtles getting like the size of a house, trees. They don't grow like that here. The winters, we get these cold winters every once in a while that burns them back to the ground. So you'll find almost all of them 
are bush shaped. And then once they start to look like a tree, we get that cold winter, burns them back to the ground again. So it's, you just see, you'll see shrubs around town. But they're pretty tough? They're I mean. tough, yeah. Well, there's crepe myrtles, there's a big variety. There's some that aren't, tro they're more tropical, and there's some that are hardy. That's why you want to buy all of your crepe myrtles from Waters Garden Center. Because <laughs> <laughs> we only, we curate, we curate only the hardy ones. Okay? They're typically his own seven plant. They'll go down to zero degrees. So you've got this one, and I thought it went well with this Coreopsis. Now usually these are tickweed, or there's several, this Coreopsis is a common name. This one's unusual in that it's red. Almost always they're, they're yellows or oranges. This one's red, or it's whatever that is, two-tone color that is. Summer bloomer, it's self-pruning, so once it gets done blooming, it'll, it'll drop that flower, not the whole stem though, um, and then it'll set another flower on it. Great pollinator, butterflies love this particular plant, but that just, that just goes what is it called? together, Coreopsis, okay? Uh, or what's the, actual, what's the actual name on it? Berry Chiffon, that's a good name, I like it. Berry Chiffon, Coreopsis, okay? Then I thought I'd pair it with these two guys. This is my favorite grass, this coral forester grass. It starts blooming in April. It's crazy how long this, these, these uh, heads are, or feather grass is another name, looks like feathers. But it, gets, it only gets this tall, so in the ground it's gonna be hip high and it blooms from April, Mother's Day, somewhere in there, through, the, through January, it's got these heads on them. Eventually, in the winter, the snows will come and get it to lay down, that's when I cut it back. Just amazing long bloom cycle. And then I noticed, if you have pets, dogs, dogs like to nibble on stuff, and so they love nibbling on my coral forester grass, so I plant some just for them. They go out and graze, and like cattle or something. But they just love it, so they like the taste or something. I would say don't tempt, since my dogs like it, it probably means that uh, rabbits will like it too, that deer will like it, that other animals will like it, so kind of watch that one. This is uh, Rudbeckia. Isn't that pretty? Look at that, stunning. Animals don't eat this. Rabbits, deer, that kind of javelina, don't bother this. It's got, a, it's got a texture to the leaf, it's got a hair all over it as a defense. And so when animals eat this, that hair gets stuck in their throat and they're kind of going, oh, I, need a, I need a soda or something, I need some water or something. And so they don't eat it, they leave it alone. This is a tremendous bird attractor because it throws off seed. And so the birds will come in in the fall. Uh, typically what I'll do with mine, this is Gallardia, any of these bigger flowers, daisies, I'll deadhead, when it's done blooming, I'll pinch this off then it'll encourage more flowers to come. I'll do that till about September, and then I'll let it just flower and go to seed so that it can help my birds through winter. So I, I purposely let it go to seed. And then also what you'll find is you'll get more plants going back next year. So it will reseed and come up in the yard. Echinaceas are that way, Gallardias are that way, Coreopsis. A lot of these perennials will actually reseed. Uh, put it at the top of the hill, it'll reseed and spill down the the driveway or down that garden hill and just you'll just find flowers coming up down there it just spreads so good good combos so you got oranges reds whatever color that is pink white whatever and a grass i think we need more grasses planted here ken would you yeah. spell that or tell me the name of that one the rubecchia Rube rubecchia oh the actual full name is sonora kind of has a sonora look doesn't it screams i want to be in arizona Good plant for here. This one is drought hardy, super tough. Consider native. The others aren't. There's the combo. Okay, let's go with this combo. This is one I think we should plant more of instead of Russian sage. Less invasive, far less maintenance to this. It's called an Agastache. I wish it had a better name. I wonder if they actually have a, oh, Summer Love. <laughs> Agastache. Comes in pinks, comes in oranges, reds, kind of bright colors like this. It gets about knee high, a little bit shorter than, than, uh, than a Russian sage, but it still has a spiky feel, but it doesn't run. Russian sage will come up, it just comes up all over the yard. Um, this one has far less, and hummingbirds, 
think they've died and gone to heaven. That's glabra looks like penstemon? Kind of. Sure, it has a turbulent shape of, of a penstemon. But it's a summer bloom. Penstemon are typically in the spring, one of the first flowers to bloom. This one is a summer lover. Loves the heat. You just surround it with rock, kick dirt at it, take a blow dryer, blow it on it. It's going to be happy as can be. And it comes back every year. So it's a good heat lover. And I paired that with every yard needs one of these. This is autumn sage or salvia is another name it goes by. This is called raspberry, raspberry delight. It's a brighter, it's a new color. I don't know what color that is. I wish God gave me, gave men more than seven crayons. But, uh, it's magenta. There we go. The women, they give, God gave you 64 crayons and you use them all. You probably got the 128 pack, huh? Nice. I love it. So this one gets about, I don't know, just above knee high or so. Blooms from May through uh, October, November, somewhere in there. Then it finally goes dormant. Uh, twiggy. It will actually come back from the stems, not just from the ground. Most perennials die to the ground, come back fresh from the ground. This one will actually come back much like a bush will. How do you trim them in the fall? You trim them in the fall. Typically what I do is I don't trim them in the fall. I'll trim them early, early, early spring. I want the foliage on these. Most of these I'll keep the foliage up, um, mainly to protect it. If we get a real harsh winter, that extra foliage will keep some of the cold out. It's like putting a blanket on it. So it helps protect the core, the heart of the plant. And I find I have less winter kill if we have a crazy, harsh, cold winter. Especially your borderline plants. This is seven and eight zone plants. That's borderline. If we go sub-zero, they're going to get nipped or killed altogether. So this one especially. I've lost some in real harsh winters. But when I leave them, I prune them back typically in March. I'll kind of cut them back. And I just give them a haircut. I'll take them back and shape them because they get kind of a mangy, wild look, which is good for some of you. Artists love that. The engineers and nurses hate that. So the, the more perfection folks, they want things exact. Now uh, the accountants are going to want it to be perfect little Dr. Seuss round things. And there's, that's okay. Uh, some folks want, my wife is a wild woman. She wants it all to look like she just flew in from wherever. And it's wild Arizona. She wants that. I don't like that. I like a little more groomed. This is uh, creeping flocks. You're starting to see this bloom. Tall flocks. There's a tall flocks. It gets about this tall. This is creeping. Just does this. This is this is fully mature. Tall as it's going to get, but it will end up being this big around. Just continue to grow. And eventually, when it comes out, you can take a shovel and divide it. Have some more over here. You can actually spread it through the yard. Super tough plant for your. Reseeds a little bit, but isn't that pretty? This has a real long bloom cycle. It just does this. It's hard to find a ground cover that will take that much sun. What about rabbits and deer? Rabbits and deer. Anyone have experience with this? Any rabbits and deer eating? Uh, it says deer resistive. The key word here is resistive. <laughs> it means most of the deer read the label, not all of them. <laughs> so it just varies, which means also rabbits are generally in that. Rabbits and deer kind of operate the same way. So, and then also, I just like the color combos of these. Sprite, cheery, um, and I what's paired the, it with this switchgrass. What's the red one again? Red one is salvia. Oh, that's the Yeah, or autumn sage is another name. Common name is autumn sage. We sell a lot of different autumn sages. This is, oh my gosh, Shenandoah grass, switchgrass. Just call it switchgrass. This is tall as it gets. The reason I love grass is the, we're so windy here. It just adds drama to the garden. It just adds a, a texture, a breeze. It's always moving. Looks great in containers. We'll grow in the yard. Super flexible. I just personally stay away from pampas grass. That human monstrous thing gets the size of like a garden shed. Yeah. I don't want that in my yard and I don't want to prune it back every year. It's too difficult to maintain. So for myself, I don't grow pampas grass in my own yard. Out at the front street, here at the commercial setting, it's nice to have something big and bold. So when people are going by Iron Springs at 50 miles an hour, it's kind of showy. Plus they're kind of tough. Plus I sell an awful lot of pampas grass because they're so showy. But I wouldn't sell it to my friends or I wouldn't use it myself. I like the smaller grasses because they're just easier to maintain and cut back. Some of these I take the riding mower and just run it right over. Done. 
I've got pruned. But you should cut these back every year to about here or so. Okay, wherever the lawnmower, weed whacker, or shears, or I love my uh, 40 volt Roby uh, electric head shear. Greatest tool ever. Battery operated, <laughs> done. It takes me about, I don't know, 10 seconds, and you're pruned back. Usually I'll prune it back. Let's see, I'll put that down here. My grasses, they will turn brown, this straw color. I like that look. I'll leave them as long as I can because it adds something in the yard. It's something to look at. It still blows the wind, still see the seed heads, but eventually the, the snow will come in January, February, it'll get it to load up and it'll lay over. Now it's not so good looking, so that's my cue to cut it back, okay? Same with pampas grass. Are Usually they, January, February, March, I'll cut them back. Now are there actually multiple varieties of, of some of these grasses or you, you just okay. stay with a few of these that you... There are multiple varieties. I chose one. I just like the way that blue of the grass and the red of the seed head picks up on, on these. So I'm going for style. It's more garden design is the reason I, put, I chose this specific grass with these companion plants. They're going to like the same part of the garden, but they look good together. Now this is really important when we have a lot of rock lawns. Rock is not your friend. <laughs> it, it does cut down on maintenance, it does reduce water, but it makes a garden style. It, it really shows if you're a gardener or not. Uh, in the Midwest, we've got lawn every place. California, I mean Phoenix, they've lawned over Phoenix and they put a pool in the middle of it. You can slop gardens together if you've got that much green in the yard. You can blunder your way through and it still looks okay. It feels okay, at least it's cool. Here, if you're surrounded by lunar rock and you put one tree in the middle, people are gonna be talking about you. They're, they're, they're going, what's wrong? They run out of money, what's going on? They, they like the heat, what, they never come out of their house? Um, the style, your style is more important when you've got less green, less, uh, less plants. So you, do, you need to be more deliberate, more on to the style piece. It's important. And then when you throw animals in the mix, you took all your plant choices, now you only have this many choices. Now you got to think through angular, uh, triangular angles, and how to plant things together, layering, because you don't have many choices. So you need to be really deliberate on that garden design piece. That's where the art piece comes out. I'm trying to share some of that. Now let's go more southwestern, shall we? Every yard needs at least one of these. A uh, yucca. It's basic, but boy does it like Arizona. Water it one year, take it off of all care or irrigation, goes by itself. Hummingbirds like it. When the seed head finally puts to, this flower head finally goes to seed, you simply cut that off down here, done, it's evergreen. Be careful if you're new to the area, guide your gardeners. Gardeners are blithering idiots. They couldn't find a job, but they had a pickup truck and a shovel. And now they're a gardener, okay? Just be aware, that's what's going on. The mistake I see is people, some of the gardeners, God, it drives me nuts. They treat it like grass, they come and mow it down. And then it takes two years to recover. They should be shot, and they should be, something should be done to them. Uh, so this should be evergreen, it should never be cut. If anything, I'll nip the tips if it gets burned back a little, but that's hardly anything. So the main thing is just prune this off, leave this intact. So tell your gardeners what to do. They don't actually know. You've been to a garden class. Ken told, Ken said, just kind of, but this is a, there's different types of yuccas. They all do pretty well here. I wish we could grow the blue agave, that blue looking yucca thing. When they make tequila out of, the, they harvest the roots and stuff. It just doesn't winter over here. I've gotten it to winter over one year and then it died. So it just, I can't get it to take. So global warming, another three or four or five years, maybe it'll, maybe we can get it to go. But right now, too what do cold. You, what do you, what's the name of that one? This is Red Yucca. <laughs> they also have one called Yellow Yucca. <laughs> There's two types, that's it. Yeah. And there is a brake light, there's a dwarf. This one gets up about this tall, just below hip high, above knee high or so. Flowers will be up about chest high. But they make a dwarf brake lights, like the, the flowers are the color of brake lights. It's that, and it's dwarf. When it gets this tall, the flowers hover about this way. Looks really great in containers, that kind of thing. I paired that with Lantana, 
All you Phoenix, Tucson folks, you love your lantana. It doesn't grow up here. There's two varieties that are hardy enough. This one, and then there's a Miss Huff, more of the orange. I'm showing you this one because orange lantana is just like, everyone's seen that. This is called um, Marianne lantana. Just a bright, what is that? Popsicle gold or something? I don't know, it's just pretty and bright. I thought it would go off the red of the, the flowers of the, the, uh, um, the yuccas. Gets big, gets, gets about this big around, about this tall. This big, showy, summer blooming perennial. This one will actually come back for us. It's zone seven perennial. So just trying to pick up on the colors and then the texture is kind of different. The green of the foliage picks up on the blue of the, the, the yucca. Just looks good for companion plants. Then I thought, I think every yard should have one of these. It's getting a little big. It's called cat mint. Animals don't eat it. It comes back every year. It's drought hardy, naturalizes, and it's one of the first perennials to bloom in spring. So it's when all the bees are starting to migrate, the, flower, the, the pollinators are migrating, they use this as a food source. It's great for if you're into butterflies, hummingbirds, that kind of stuff. But mainly, you cut it back and it comes back to bloom again. Cut it back again, comes back to bloom again. If you fertilize it and trim out a little bit, it'll bloom in waves, much like a rose. It'll have this flush of flowers, take a rest, flush of flowers, take a rest. It has a very long bloom cycle. It just looks like Arizona blue. What's it called? Cat mint. Yeah, is it in the same mint family? So it spreads a lot and takes No, over. no, it's not a mint, not a true mint. In fact, it's not even related to actual spearmint, peppermint, some of those, because that is a weed, very invasive. This one just has this cute little mounding pattern. That's all, just gets about that tall, and then just mounds. Cute as can be in the garden. Plant in a raised bed, plant out in the yard, just by the driveway. It'll like the heat and the sun, it's great. And I thought I'd pair it with this. These kind of go together. This is uh, Gallardia. What's the name on that? Sunset Snappy. That's a terrible name. How about Snappy Sunset? Something now. Anyway, it's a red. Usually this comes in orange and yellows. Very, very unusual to see any red on a Gallardia or blanket flowers, the other name. But it just goes with, I mean, just they just go together. Same sun, same wind, same garden, same. They'll just be companions to be happy, cheering each other on to bloom more and more for their gardener. That's what it's gonna be. Good, good plants. This one is another uh, bird. I plant this one quite a bit for my birds because these seed heads form some great seed drills. Sparrows, finches, they love to use this as a food source through the winter. It's super important for them. So again, what I'll do is I'll pinch off the dead flowers and we'll just say this one's dead. I'll pinch that off. It'll set another bud. You see it's loaded with buds right there. It'll form a new bud. I'll keep doing that through summer, through fall, and about September, mid-September, I'll let that last flush of flowers bloom and go to seed. And I'll keep those seed on the plant right through winter. The birds will use it December, January. As the weather gets harsher, they come in. And then also it'll reseed. It'll come up in other places. Good native Arizona drought hardy zero skeet plant. Okay, I didn't put a grass with that one. It's unusual. Oh, please a ton. Yes. Okay, let's go hardcore southwest. Some of you love, have Phoenix envy, envy, so we'll go desert. Anyone know what this is? Ocotillo. Ocotillo, yeah, very, very good. So this actually is at the very upper edge. Prescott, it doesn't quite grow here, but you'll see it growing here in some places. I think there's some microclimates. If you've got a, a rock wall, a fence line where it just radiates heat on the south side, I think that's the place for this. Surrounded by rock and never, ever water it. That's Ocotillo. I've got a neighbor right down the street, live up in Eagle Ridge, 56, 5,700 feet, and it is glorious. It is this tall, huge vase shape, and it's in bloom right now. So you can do that. We In the, in the garden center, we kill these just by watering it. Just be careful, this is super drought hardy. Yeah, but Ocotillo, it can grow here, especially we'll grow in Prescott Valley, Dewey, Mayer, Humboldt, all that lower elevation, 5,000 foot and lower, psh, be fine. Grows naturally in Skull Valley, that 4,000 hill, hill, hillside, Kirkland, all those areas, that's where it grows wild. So you're, you're right on the upper edge, but it's a good plant. You gotta pair that with 
Doesn't look like much, but it's been blooming in my yard for two, three months already. This is Jupiter's beard, a great native for here. You never get just one. So if you're in a tidy, you like your rock lawn and one plant and no, nothing else, stay away from this because it's going to reseed and come up in other places. So it does like to populate and go down a hillside or down a streamline. But I, I've got certain gardens where that just looks fabulous. For mine, mine has been in bloom. It stopped blooming. I cut it back, fertilize it, and it will come back and flush again another set of flowers for me. So Jupiter's beard is good native, uh, kind of like a pinstamen leaf, but the flower is totally different. I do notice my butterfly swallowtails love this plant. They're all over it all the time. Okay. Jupiter's beard. How tall can it? That's, that's fully mature. Figure about knee high. And, and the flowers hover just, just about knee height. How okay. far do you cut it back when you cut it? I cut mine back pretty hard because it's near a walkway and it was getting in the way. And I like my shears. And I like them battery operated when I can. So I just went, <laughs> cut them back. And so I cut it back probably close to half, fertilized again. And then of course, ugh, this one tried to bite me when I started. This one did bite me actually. This is Little Rita prickly pear. Uh, we don't grow a lot of cacti up here. Uh, very, very few because very few cactus actually have antifreeze in them. Most of them just freeze out. Okay, we get into mid-November, they turn black, they turn into black mush and just fall over. They froze to death. Prickly pear, there's quite a few of them that grow really, really well up here. This one's got the cutest flower. I had yesterday, it had a flower. Of course it dropped. You should perform better. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's got this real pretty, cute, cream to yellow colored flower, but it's, it's daintier. So many of the prickly pear are big and aggressive. They want to come up and bite your ankles as you get out of the car. This one doesn't have that same, doesn't do that as, as easily. Be careful, it is thorn, but it goes with, oh, I'm going to drop it. Watch it, you're in danger. <laughs> <laughs> These things just kind of go together. They just look good. They just look good together. Looks southwestern, but mountain desert. Doesn't look like Phoenix desert. Looks like us. Because it is us. They grow wild here. Okay. How much water does that one need? Virtually none. Any of these, none. None. This is your southwest. Zero scape. I like rock. No, I don't want irrigation. Just water for a year and they'll go by themselves from there. It's one of those. Many of my natives, I'll actually put a dripper to it. And I'll have it on the cycle for a year. Then I bend it back and tape it off, thinking, in case it needs me later, I'm here for you. And I have never once turned the irrigation back on. So Russian sage, some of these, some Akatillo, these guys, these naturalized didn't just come up in the yard. I never water them. They just come up and bloom. So and they can do the same for you. Some of the Russians, some Russians. Yeah, Russian, Russian sage is overdone sometimes. I wouldn't plant a big Russian sage. You make a dwarf variety, only gets about this tall. Only go with that one. And still it wants to run. Don't let Russian sage get out of, get out of hand. So, and then don't water them. Because right now with all this moisture, you can tell the ones that are watered because they almost get drunken. And they're like, that's so much water. And they flop over and they lay down in the garden. That's too much water. They need to be dried out more. So I'd kind of watch that one, especially the big ones. Okay, let's go with these guys. Some new plants. This is a new red hot poker. Yep. This is dwarf. So red hot poker can get some height to it. This one gets up, this is mature. So it's, it's half the size of a regular red hot poker. But this one is called mango popsicle because of the flower. Just looks like a, ooh. Doesn't smell very good, but, but hummingbirds love it. Hummingbirds really like that tubular shaped flower. They like, they're all over this. And animals leave these alone. You'll see them growing right up where javelina are thick. Deer graze through and they don't eat this. It looks delicious, but they don't bother. So it's a good little plant for here. I got that for the texture. Just give me some grassy looking stuff. You put this with regular Coreopsis. This is what normally Coreopsis looks like. It's got a red center, kind of. Usually they're reds or uh, uh, yellows and oranges. They just go together. They've got a different texture, but the flowers go together. Just getting some style 
you florists kind of know this. You're changing the styles and then matching the colors. And then here, I got this as a blanket flower. I'm trying to pick up on the, to play off this color, that red inside that uh, Coreopsis, I'm trying to pick up on that. So now all of a sudden you go, wow, that looks good together. And so guys, if, or anyone that's not good with color, here's how I do it. I look like I got it all together and I can bluff my way through. Or here's what I'm really doing. I go, nature, you can't beat it. I go, if I'm gonna match colors together, I just go find another flower that has picks up on that red. I just try to match it. That's all I do. You can't beat nature. Nature's always right. Always looks good together. So when I'm trying to, when I'm helping you with a shopping cart, I don't actually know colors, but I know how to put them together and how they look good. I know that if you're wearing a certain color, like I know you like green. I know it, I'm gonna show you colors purple. I know, cause you're wearing it on you. So I'll just go, I got blue. So like, I'll, we'll go with blue. You start putting blues together and all of a sudden the style comes together and you like it and you should like it. It should be something that you, you're proud of. This one, I plant out by my mailbox just outside the irrigation. Mailboxes are hard because they're hot. Typically they're, they're neglected because it's the last thing you see or the first thing you see, it's out there. And I'm getting the mail, I'm not looking at the flowers. This one can take neglect. It gets uh, these tall flowers that hover. This is as tall as a plant gets, but the flowers will elongate almost like a grass and they float above this plant. It's called Gaura, G-A-U-R-A. Comes in white and also comes in this really bright pink. The native one is white. So this will naturalize and go all by itself. So again, I watered it for a year and it, it gets no more care. I'll fertilize it, but I won't water it. It's gotta trust nature, okay? But I just like it because it adds motion and my hummingbirds love this plant. I mean, you'll just see them beeline it across the yard and see this flower and go boop, boop, go right for the flower. But they go together with, those just, those just look good together. Bright orange, bright, or yellow, or, or mango. Bright mango and this pink color. Is mango a color? Is mango, do you actually have yeah. mango in the crayon no, box? It really? Yeah, it was I'm such a man. Okay. What's that little red one? This is blanket flower. Oh, a blanket flower? Yeah, red shades, Arizona red shades. Gallardia is the actual Latin name, Gallardia. Okay, let's go shade, should we do that? Oh, I was matching this with that too. This would actually play off with this, uh, with these guys. Trying to pick up on these. Yeah. See how they contrast and, and this is a shrub. This is elderberry. Remember your grandparents made elderberry wine, elderberry jam, elderberry, elderberry. I don't know what you do with elderberries. I just love the foliage. It's beautiful. This is a new one called Black Lace. Just has this dark color. No, normally elderberries are green. But to see this dark color, fast growing, it gets up to about head high. This big vase shaped uh, shrub, it's lacing. You put these as an underplanting in the front. All of a sudden you've got, oh, going to a, to a gate, or to the front door, to a, to a raised bed. That's gonna look good together. All right, black lace elderberry. And it will actually put some fruit on if you want that. Or you just leave it, the birds will be happy. Shade, 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 shade. Shade is actually harder than sun. We have way more sun options than we do shade options. Um, a lot of ferns will grow here. There are some native ferns that grow in Arizona. Uh, this is actually ostrich fern. Isn't that pretty? It's a classic classic kind of fern. This does not want more than maybe three hours of sun. So it can take some morning sun. Keep it out, all of these. Keep them out of that midday heat or they will suffer. They'll get burned tips. You'll, they'll live, but you'll hate them. So you want to get them in just the right place where they shine or they really are bright. But I like this. In a darker area, under your trees, in a pot underneath that overhang, where it's just dark, but you're entertaining. This has got that bright green, Kelly green color. It feels, feels like I just landed from Ireland. Just, just says, welcome, I love you. Plant more of me, it's that. You plant that with this, this is, anyone know what this is? Old fashioned plant, plumbago. I love plumbago in that it's got one of the few flowers that's actually blue. 
bright blue. So most things are like lavender or purple. This has just got a bright blue color. And then it spreads. This, this is as mature as it gets, and then it spreads like this. So I've got this planted next to my stairs, going downstairs on a um, northeast side, and it's just happy as can be, growing in the shade. Perennial. Every year it's been there for years. It just looks just like this, only now it's this big around instead of one little plant. So plumbago. And it just goes with the darker foliage, goes with that fern. They just go together. You plant those with this. Let's go over this first. This is coral bells, what your grandparents called it, because the bell comes up, kind of curves. But the actual name in the magazines, hookera. The H E U R S, sounds like you hacked up a fur ball or something. Hookera. Oh. Um, comes in a lot of color choices Kelly green, uh, bright yellows, purples, coppers. You're planting this for the foliage. I love planting hookera at the base of my trees as an underplanting. So it take, it's so tough, it'll take the same drip irrigation cycle that your trees will. So I plant it right where, where, where the dripper is for the tree. And then it will take some sun, it'll take a lot of sun. Mainly it's so deep rooted that it'll take the same water cycle that your trees will. But as the tree grows and shades, it'll also take the shade. So it looks more natural. Trees are not, they're not naturally made to look like they're erupting out of rocks. It's better to have an underplanting, something to soften up that rock layer uh, and, and accent that tree coming up. Looks more more like nature meant it to happen that way. So hookera. Uh, deer, deer don't bother this. Nothing bothers this. They should, but it just, it does, oh they do? I had, I planted some out in an area that was exposed and it was too damp. Oh, more than so if you have deer, deer <laughs> rabbits you think? Probably rabbits. Rabbits, so rabbits eat this. So kind of watch that. Barbecue sauce, shotgun, and a nice crock pot. Okay. No, don't you deny. I'm just kidding, folks. Okay, Abelia. This is a shrub. It gets up about this high. Okay. It looks innocent. It looks cute, but it gets up about this high. But it shine. It, it does this for a long time. May through fall it has these delicate white flowers, and this is evergreen. So it'll keep this bright colored foliage year round. So you can trim it up and almost hedge it. Almost looks like a hedge kind of thing. But it gets these wild, softened. It's like a, I don't know how to describe that. Here, it's like this. <laughs> it, it's, okay. This is Abelia Miss Lemon. That's a good name. I like that because the bright yellows. So hummingbirds like it. Good plant. Does it say deer? I don't know. But it's good to have a test victim. So someone try it, let us know. That's how you actually learn. Or you walk through a neighborhood, you see what's growing there, and you can get a real quick feel. Or it's going, oh, here we go. Delphinium. I picked it up just for the blue. Kind of picked up off of that. So that size is kind of blue. And it also goes with, well, either one of these. That just looks good together. It complements. Got an evergreen that gets taller. Uh, just bright blue. Delphinium, nothing gets that kind of blue. And you're welcome to come up afterwards and just poke around. And you know, I did pick the prettiest one on the table. You don't show off to your friends your ugly one. You take the pretty one. And so if you want, you can buy these afterwards. So just come look at the labels, take what you want. Now let's go southwestern again. Some plants that just go together. This is an agave for a century plant. The myth is Century plants bloom once a year, once every century. That's not real. That's not a thing. Generally, about every 20 years, century plants would put that huge stalk that grows almost a foot a day. It just gets this huge, my, my buddy calls it the Viagra plant. It just goes like crazy. Um, that's agave. This is a new one in that it's called tongues, uh, whale's tongue agave. This is a different variety. This is a zone eight, so it's borderline for here. I would say if you're up in the ridge lines, don't plant it because it'll freeze. But if you're in the lower areas or you got a bright uh, courtyard, someplace hot in the yard, um, I would say try this. It's going to be fun. It's just unusual to see that, that unusual pattern. Most of them are called the artichoke or uh, uh, agave, century plant. It's very tight, very perfectly shaped. 
which is pretty, but this is prettier, just different, unusual. It will get the same flower. That says Arizona. It goes with, we grow herbs almost better than anyone else in the country. Herbs, we don't get the, the mildews. Because it's dry and it's bright in the altitude, they love growing here. So you'll find your rosemaries almost do better than even Phoenix. They take a rest, they'll bloom longer. Uh, the thing I like about rosemary, it's, it's one of the first perennials to bloom in the mountains of Arizona. So again, for my pollinators, guys that are migrating north, they're using this as a food source. Bees, early on, when they just come out of hibernation, they're hungry, they're foraging like crazy. They're looking for food. They use this as a major food source until the next set of flowers starts to, to come out. So rosemary, evergreen, yes, you can cook with it. This one happens to be a carpet or a ground cover or a spreading a rosemary. They also have one that gets taller, which is a upright or Tuscan or, or barbecue rosemary. Sometimes you can take these long stems, strip off the, uh, uh, strip off the leaves and you can use them as skewers for a bigger upright one. Not so much with the ground cover variety, but your upright ones, they call them barbecue because of skewer. Yeah, it's wonderful. Mm, 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 mm. And native uh, yarrow. This one again is our is our Arizona yellow. This also comes in paprika, uh, orange, kind of more reddy looking colors, but this is the one that grows wild. This is also the one the animals won't eat. They will eat the other yellowy kind of ones. So the, the native one they don't like, yellow, and it just does this. I'm about to prune mine back. Mine had been in bloom for a long time. Now I've got all these dead spent heads. I'm gonna take the shears and cut off the heads keep the foliage because it's beautiful even without the flowers and I'll fertilize it and it will come back into bloom again for me. Okay, so yarrow is really good. Yeah, yarrow. Well, um, moonshine yarrow. Again, you can look at the tags. That just goes together. And that's just same Arizona blue, but this has the yellow to it. Yellows and blues are Arizona. They just, most of the plants here are yellow and blue. Another indication too is that generally animals don't like the color if it's got blue foliage, animals don't like it. Or if the foliage is two-toned, it's white underneath, it's got colored on the front, generally they don't like that uh, two-toned leaves. Oh yeah, thank you. If it's, if it's below my, my hips, I just don't see it. It's just like it. This is uh, Gold Bar, what's the actual name? Gold Bar Maiden Grass. It just does this. I mean, just, how does it do that? How do you get yellow and green? I don't know. It's beautiful. Uh, again, this will keep its structure through most of winter. Snow will come and get it to lean over, cut it back, fertilize, grows back again just like this. This will actually get twice as high as it is now. And it'll have this real pretty uh, seed head or plume on it uh, in the fall. So, gold bar mating grass. This, could, this is more of a sun. Yeah. Actually, this could go in shade, too. I've got one of these in shade. It could go either. Where do you want it? It can grow. Yeah. Can you plant that now? Yeah, you can plant it now. I would like it. This is the time to plant grasses because you can see them. In spring, grasses are ugly because they're cut back and they're, they haven't grown yet. Most perennials are ugly in March, April, first part of May. And then once they start coming back from the roots and growing, you're going, oh, that's when they get inspiring. By June, July, they start to actually bloom. That's when you want. To, that's when you really get to see what that perennial is all about. So again, Coreopsis or tickweed. This is called Little Bang Red Elf tickweed or Coreopsis. Again, it reseeds like crazy, naturalizes, goes by itself. You can go and raise beds and containers right on the yard. Pretty flexible. This is a new variety. It's a dwarf variety of Chase chase tree usually this the uh, uh, cousin of this the original gets well above head height huge vase shape up to about eight ten feet tall with blue flowers are starting to bloom all around town right now this one because that its cousin got way too big they came out with a dwarf and i think this gets just just short three by three what do you call it? what's the chase name? tree c-h-a-s-e -C -H -E, chase tree or blue puffball Vitex, yeah. Vitex or Chase Tree. It's a native, kind of like a butterfly bush, but this is hardier and longer lived. 
fact, this if you get my newsletter, this week you're gonna see uh, in the newsletter, I was pulling out some butterfly bush. I'm teaching people how easy it is to pull out butterfly bush. Because it's a real soft, uh, I was pulling out all my butterfly bush in the front of the, front of the house as they were getting overgrown. They weren't blooming, they were ugly. If you're ugly in my yard, you're out. And so I just went, here's how you do it. Boom. In about 30 seconds, or even less. I mean, it's like a 90 second video. And I'm showing off the entire front landscape. And I go, here's how you pop one out. Don't, don't let your butterfly bush bring you down. They're only meant to live for about five, seven years at most. They're very short lived. Once they stop blooming or performing, get rid of them. This guy, much longer lived. Uh, it'll live almost, it'll outlive you, any of us. This is a long lived native tree kind of thing. So I think this is a better plant for your, okay. All right, can you get everything? Oh, what else? What else do I have here? These guys, anyone know what this is? A weed? This is a Mexican primrose, okay? Don't put this in the wrong, this is like mint. If you put it in the wrong place, it will take over. I mean, it's choked out dogs. I mean, people have gone down, they just, we're taking over. It just grows so fast. And so be careful, I always put this never in the middle of a flower bed. I always put it off to the edge where it can be neglected. Like I put it by the driveway where I can run over it with the truck. Put it places where you can abuse it. That's where you put Mexican primrose. But it blooms a long time. Now a little insider tip, uh, Mexican primrose does put a little seed head on. So when it gets done blooming, it'll, it'll just stop blooming and it starts forming seed. If you take some, a mower or weed whacker and just whack off the flowers, be fertilized, it'll go into a whole other set of flowers for you. You can force this to bloom three, four times in a, in a growing season just by deadheading or pruning back after it's done blooming. Okay. What's missing in the soil if mine is white, not pink? White? So her question was, what's, what's missing if her flowers went white instead of pink? Usually that's a pH thing. The pH has crept up too high. And so if you can add some sulfur, bring the pH down, the color will come out. Same with fragrance, you notice your flowers, your roses. They were fragrant last year, this year they aren't as fragrant. That's usually a pH thing. The color will fade, the fragrance will disappear. We're, it's our water, our water's very alkaline, okay? And then this one is another dwarf variety of red hot poker. And this is called, well, no, it's the same thing, mango popsicle. I brought the same thing twice. <laughs> I like it that much. Again, dwarf, this is as tall as it gets, just gets knee high, that's it. What's the blooming time on that one? This will bloom usually in the spring, late spring, early summer, that time frame. Mine are just finishing up blooming. What I'll do is, let me put these down. What I'll do is I'll just take these spent flowers. And I've got to do that in the next week or so because none of the blooms are left. I'll just pinch those off and I'll keep this foliage up on the plant. Got this behind my pond. It just looks really good with that spiky flowery thing, water flowing in the front, hummingbirds going by, butterfly. I mean, it just says, Ken, Dang, I think you've lost weight. Look at that. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to the garden. They just like us. No kidding. Here's your butterfly bush, because it is a number one seller. I sell a lot of butterfly bush, but I think sometimes we keep them in the ground too long. And for 25 bucks, you have a brand new one that blooms fresh for the next five years, they do get old. They get where they lose their their vigor, something where they just stop, they stop doing what they're supposed to do. Agave, um, this happens to be a new dwarf variety. So many butterfly bush get giant, and they get eight feet tall if you let them go. Be really aggressive at pruning them. And then they're coming out with a whole series. The name of this one is Miss Ruby. That sounds good, looks like a ruby. Miss Ruby Butterfly Bush, and it gets short, doesn't say easily, but it gets up about that tall. Half the height of a regular butterfly bush, but with the same flower, okay, and you get some color options. This is a century plant again, or agave, century plant agave is the same thing, just you got a different, remember we had the, the whale's tongue? This is a little more structured. Just be careful, it does want to skewer you as you walk by. So you want to give it some space. You don't want to be where the grandkids are going to run around. That would not be good. Or where you're throwing the ball for the dog or where you're going to be right next to a walkway. These have a space and this will turn into a plant about this big around. So 
So it gets, it looks innocent, but it grows. It's so happy it's coming out of its bucket. <laughs> Agave. Let's go to the last two. We're going to take some questions. This is a native that grows wild up in the Bradshaws, kind of all the ridge lines. Um, it's called Mahonia or Oregon grape. It has a bright yellow flower in spring. And some of them you'll see berries. They'll make actually jams and stuff. This one doesn't have berries. Sometimes the birds get in, they eat the berries off. They're very sweet, very delicious. And this is its color year round. Uh, they make three heights of this. The standard one gets about chest high. This is called compact or, or, or dwarf. Gets about hip high. They make a creeping Mahonia or, or ankle high. Not even a foot, about that tall. Does really well in the shade and does really well in the sun. Very flexible. Um, Oregon grape holly, because the leaf actually has kind of a holly, kind of a holly leaf, shaped leaf. It's not a holly, not an ilex whatsoever. It's Mahonia. Totally different plant, but it's a native for here. Again, water it one year, bend back that irrigation, don't water it anymore. It's one of those. So it's an evergreen? Evergreen, yep. Evergreen, ever beautiful. And it can be a bit aggressive. It does take some maintenance. So it wants to run and come up other places, take a shovel to the head and just kind of, no, you're not growing air, get it out. Uh, so keep them in check. If you're going in where you, where you want them to grow, great. As soon as they get out of hand, get rid of them. This is uh, roses. We do roses really well here. I think some folks are afraid of roses. There's some low care roses. I, I grow a lot of these. These are shrub or, or carpet roses. They're more of a shrubby, they're not grafted roses. Uh, hybrid teas, floribundas, grandiflores, those are all grafted type of roses. This one's not grafted. So it's far less maintenance. All I do with this, I'll go through when it's done. This is so pretty. I'll just go through and I'll deadhead the flower so it doesn't form a rose hip. So it keeps pushing flowers. I don't count back three nodes and 45 degree angle. I am, I butcher this like Edward Scissorhand. <laughs> Poor party, I just pick up all the spent flowers and go, that's it, fertilize, and it does this for an amazingly long time. And we just don't get black spot. So rare to have black spot here. Every once in a while, if it's in a shady, wet spot, maybe. But because we're so dry, um, we just don't have a lot of the mildew issues that the other, other parts of the country can have. I did actually have to dig one of these out just this week. I had planted in a, in a bed that was bright sun. These needed at least six hours of sun. And so, and finally, the mimosa that was growing up, it's this beautiful umbrella-shaped tree. It finally grew up and shaded this too much. It was getting mildew, it wasn't bloomy, it was thin and wispy. It had outgrown, or the tree had overshadowed the rose. So it just had to go. Don't be afraid. If you need to, pull up. You need to remodel your gardens. Why are you poking at him? Stop doing that, Tim. He's my friend. <laughs> Here's what I do when my wife goes off. You could go after it or, oh wait, I'm well, talking to you. When he goes off playing really that golf game, just exactly. on that yacht with the guys for a week. Exactly. Time to call in the good big guns and questions. Question between me and the plant, we got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, any question, we cover, learn a couple things. Companion plants go together. Think through style. Perennials are all about bringing things together. Oh yeah. Bringing things together and then uh, making them look good together. So this would look great. This would look great with a lot of things. Actually, this would look great with, oh, this would look great with this and this. Those are companions. This is red sedge. Sedge is kind of like a grass, but it's unique. It's got a really, it actually grows red. I use this a lot in containers. I've got a tiki head container pot. It's about this tall, this big like Easter Island head. It's kind of funky, it's quirky, I know. I put this in the, in the container for hair. It <laughs> looks great, it's like really good. So you'll, if you follow my newsletter, you'll see a picture every once in a while of that one, just because I like it. I kind of play with it, put some flowers in sometimes. But this is a great, this is as tall as it gets, and it gets bushier, so it'll get wider. It won't get any taller. Does it really bloom? It just does this all the time. So you can match it with things, you pick up on the red of your coreopsis, you play off the blue of your, of your, some of your flowers. Just adds a texture and structure that is 
really striking and unique. So you got to think like a florist or, or a designer to make it look right. Okay. Perennial. I've got some of these that are years old. Year, I mean, five, six, seven. I don't know how old they are. They keep coming back for me. Okay. Questions? Yes. Okay. Come all the water and rain we've had lately. My pots are soaking wet. Do yeah. I need to worry about them? You should worry. <laughs> yeah. Her question is, she's had a lot of rain. Should I be worried? Rain's good. I did turn my irrigation off myself earlier this week because I had I'd had close to three inches of rain. Just when did the rain start? July eighth, I think. First week in July, just after the fourth. We had, we had the monsoons kind of started. Now I've had close to three inches. That's a lot. What you'll have to be careful with is, as you turn the irrigation off, there's some things that don't get water. Like I noticed my lantana was wilting last night. Came home, it's just like going, it's not Thursday, help me. I went, okay. The irrigation wasn't going on. It was underneath an overhead, hanging there, exposed. And so it dried out. But I think it's okay to take that gardener's touch, kind of talk to the, the plants will communicate with you and let you know if you're, if you're, if you're out there at all, even, even awake, they'll tell you. If you're looking, they'll tell you. These water things underneath your overhang, kind of watch those. Those will be, they're not getting the rain. The ones that really get soaked are the ones out by the dry wash uh, where the water's flowing, they get soaked. So you can kill things right now. In fact, you're more likely to overwater things than they root rot. And so they'll, they'll especially your evergreens, they're really sensitive. Pine, spruce, fir, cedar, juniper, cypress, all those guys, they're gonna be real sensitive to this kind of water. If you've got your irrigation on and we're getting this much rain, you can kill things from overwater. Just, just watch that. I would say at the very least, back off on the frequency. You don't really play with irrigation on the length of time. Once you figure out how much water it takes to water the entire root zone, you never play with that variable again. It's always the same amount of water every time. What you're playing with is how often should I give it that much water? or the days, the skip days. I like using my skip day function on my clock. It lets you, instead of programming every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'll go skip five days, seven days, 10 days, 14 days, 30 days. It help you skip so many days. No, I don't know what day it's gonna come on. I know how, how long it's gonna go before it cycles again. So right now I'm at every 10 days for my native stuff. I wanna keep them blooming, looking good. I've now turned it off. The front yard, Trees and shrubs, roses, was at seven days. Now I've turned it off. And what I, may, what I may do is when I turn it back on, I may skip it every 12 days or I'll play with it and then monitor. So this is a time when you, you should really get familiar with your clock. It'll make a difference. It's hard to get to your head around it. I've got a whole other class on nothing but irrigation. Whole hour, just irrigation. Is that complicated? But if you read up on the manual, YouTubes, there's a lot of great info out there where you up your game really quick. On your, on your irrigation clocks? Good question.